Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Religion in the Public Square. We're looking at the second part of Christians and Government, and the outline that we have is given to us by Wayne Grudel. Let's go ahead and jump into our study today. What about Old Testament laws? Um, there's a word that it's important to look at, it's theonomy, which is the belief that the Mosaic laws should be the pattern for civil laws in the nations today. And this is a, a belief by some, not a lot of people, but some people, that the Mosaic law should be the guidelines for how civil laws are given in countries today. And there's some issues with this, and we'll look at some of those. Uh, number one, theocracies, democracies, republics, monarchies, and dictatorships are all different forms of government. So there's different forms of government. So to say a theonomy works in all those, it's a very, it's a very hard thing. Uh, it's a hard thing to do. Yes, in Christianity, the Mosaic Law can be um, can be helpful and can be a strong influence in how we set up laws, but it cannot be the way that we do things. After all, the um, the Mosaic Law was given to Moses for the Israelite people. And when you look at all those laws, there's some specific things that will happen that God says he will do. I mentioned this last time um, that in the social justice laws that God gives in Exodus 22, he said, if you do not help out the orphans, God will kill you with the sword. Um, that's a belief system. That's probably a civil law that you are not going to see in most places. Uh, but that was God's standard for the Israelite people. And so you see those standards, which are very different and interesting, talking about the Sabbath day, things like that. Those are very interesting. And there's a, there's a lack of freedom of religion when you look at the Mosaic law. So you can't really live by that. Um, we live in a free country, and we'll talk more about that as we go, but we, it's an amazing thing that we live in a free country so that we can believe what we want to. But the Jews did not have that type of freedom because they had something better. They were given everything. They are given the patriarchs. They were given the oracles of God. They were given the worship. They were given the, um, they were given the Christ, all that. Um, but of course, many of them rejected all of it. So theonomy does not work in the world system with Jews and Gentiles in general. general. And so that's why it's an, it's an issue. Also, render unto Caesar in Matthew 22, verse 21, it speaks of this. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So Jesus is saying this, and the reason he's saying this is because there's going to be leaders that are are raised up, that God raises up, and you're to render to them what belongs to them. And so that's an important thing. That doesn't come, come under theonomy as well. And then who is the one that interprets the Mosaic Law? So that's an important thing. We've talked about how the Supreme Court, uh, the justices, that they will actually interpret laws. Well, are they going to be the ones that interpret the Mosaic Laws for us as well? That that creates a lot of problems. It depends on who's interpreting them. Um, so freedom of religion is true freedom. It's where you can actually worship as you see fit uh, based on convictions as long as it doesn't cause problems or as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. All right. So um, Christians in government, there's an influence there. It's a really good thing. It's a great thing, but it has to be done a certain way. And uh, truly a freedom of religion is the great way to be um, to have Christianity as the major influences we have in this country or to have it as a, as a major influence in this country. Going further, should Christians only vote for Christian candidates? That's a great question. Great question. A lot of people are mixed, have mixed feelings about this question, um, but let me give you what Wayne Grudem says, and I kind of lean this direction as well. Christian leaders are not always the best policy makers, even though they might be uh, they might be devout in their beliefs or they might uh, endorse a certain type of belief system. Um, it may not come out well in, in politics. It may not, it just may not come out well. And so we have to consider those types of things. Look at a case here with Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Um, when you look at these two guys, you see something that is important. Uh, because Jimmy Carter was a Democrat and ran as a Democrat, and Ronald Reagan ran as a Republican. And what you see with this is um, Jimmy Carter would have been, he's the Southern Baptist minister type person. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was very involved in church, all that type of stuff. Ronald Reagan was a Christian, but not so much, not as much as Jimmy Carter would be known that way. And, um, but 
most Republicans voted, most people voted for Ronald Reagan. Why'd they do that? Because they saw his policymaking skills were better for the country than a person who came under the label as Christian. So that's an important thing to look at there. Here's another example, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. In 2012 uh, was their election, and a lot of people did not want to vote for Mitt Romney, even though he ran for as a Republican, as a conservative. They didn't want to vote for him because he was a Mormon. And so they said, well, because you're a Mormon, therefore I will not vote for you. Most evangelicals were saying stuff like that. But what would happen is that they were voting in, by not voting, you were voting in somebody else or voting for somebody else. And Barack Obama won very easily in that 2012 election. Um, and so it's not really we should vote based on somebody's just religious preference or what they espouse or what they, um, or what they like to come under the label of. We need to vote based on uh, morals and principles. We need to vote based on policy making, those types of things, because that's really who what drives our country. Um, and so we hope that the person that is running for office is a Christian. Number one, that's what we desire. Um, but it also becomes an ethical issue as well. Who is the lesser, maybe of two evils? Um, and we have to vote that way as well. So a lot of people said they couldn't vote for Donald Trump. Um, because they saw him as a person surrounded by scandal, person surrounded by immorality, that type of guy that he was, and they wouldn't, didn't want to vote for him. But actually, when you look at who he's running against, it's Hillary Clinton. Now, who are you going to vote for? And so that's when it becomes an ethical, ethical issue. Very, very big deal. Should Christians only vote for Christian candidates? Not necessarily. Principles and policies should guide the Christian vote, not religious and affairs not religious affiliation or denominational preferences. Uh, Wayne Grudem says, I think Christians should support the candidate who best represents moral and political values consistent with biblical teaching, no matter what his or her religious backgrounds or convictions. And and I definitely uh, agree with that. Ah, just this kind of uh, is close to the time of, of the, uh, the celebration of the passing of Dr. Martin Luther King, Junior and um, coming up on it, MLK 50 is what we're looking at 50 years later. Um, but but that's I'm showing some different slides of him. And that's why I'm doing that. But I love what he said here. And so we shall have to do more than register and more than vote. We shall have to create leaders who embody virtues we can respect, who have moral and ethical principles we can applaud with enthusiasm. What a great quote. He's saying we got to raise up these type of people. Uh, we got to. Nef definitely vote them in, but we've got to raise them up as well. So we've got to raise the generations after us. Um, the next point is without Christian influence, governments will have no clear moral compass. Um, I want to give you some things that um, Christians have had a major influence on. Just wars is one of them. Um, simply, why do we go to war? Is it right to go to war? Yes, it is. Certain times it was very right to go to war with the Nazi, with Nazi Germany, to um, to wipe them out because of the evil that they were doing. So there's just wars to stop people from doing the things that they're doing. Christians have a very strong influence. Same sex marriage, it's important. Same sex marriage is 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 not good for society. It is not good for people. It's not good for the home. It's not good for any of that. Can there be some moral people that are of same sex marriage? Would you call them moral? You might call them moral in the sense that they treat people with decency and kindness, but as far as God is concerned and holiness and godliness, no, they're actually pulling away from God's system of procreation. They're pulling away of God's system of doing things. A male and a female should be in the home, so they're pulling away from all those things, and actually it's, uh, it's truly abomination um, to the Lord. Um, number three, abortions are evil. They are killing, it's the killing, the murdering of young children. Um, and so Christians are fighting against this pornography, fighting against these things that are actually causing so many problems. Poverty. Christians have been on the forefront of fighting against that. Care for the environment. Christians are actually, if we truly follow God's his baseline for things or the way that we live our lives, we're going to care for the people around us. We're going to care for the things around us. And we're going to treat things with respect and be good stewards of all that God's given us. Capital punishment is another big one. Uh, should people be... Um, Christians have had a strong influence on this because 
people should be punished for what they have done and and they should be extinguished from society if um if they continue to kill if they continue to kill people then there's capital punishment that is that is a law to say hey this is and many most christians majority of christians would fall in that category also number eight education christians are huge in pushing that moral standards um no we could also add how that Christians have influenced foster care, widow care, civil rights, gun rights, bathroom policies. Today, this is a major issue. Who can go into bathrooms? Um, bullying issues, opioid addiction, social media addiction, depression, suicide, etc. All these things Christians are fighting against because they see that they're causing, there are a lot of social ills called, caused by this, and, um, and they're fighting it for or against these things appropriately um, to, to help this, this nation advance and, and succeed. And, and the hope is, is to be moral and have high standards and be wise about what we have. Going forward, the responsibility of pastor to teach on political issues. This is a good topic as well. Is preaching about politics too controversial? Not if done correctly. Pastors have a responsibility to stand up for what is moral and wise. What is moral and wise? Also, pastors need to inform congregants about politics in order for them to vote biblically. So if the pastor or ministers or whoever it might be in leading a church, if they are not helping in the process of who to vote for, then you're going to have people just voting what they think or based on how many billboards they've seen, they might vote, which is a very dangerous thing. They need to be informed. Number three, just because something is controversial does not excuse pastors from their duty as the citizen, as a citizen of the U.S. Uh, very important thing as well. We just because something's controversial, we don't need to run from it. We actually need to talk about it still. But also, pastors must be careful to avoid placing too much emphasis or emphases on politics. And we do need to be careful about that because the church is not a place where we just become political. The church is a place where we are gospel-centered. And through that, we might, we're might we also going to be good citizens. And through that, we're also going to inform people on um, on important ways of living and what candidates believe and those types of things. And that's a, that's a major thing. I want to show you this survey of Protestant pastors, pastors in politics. Pastors should endorse candidates for public office from the pulpit. 87% agree that pastors should be able to endorse candidates from for public office from the pulpit. 10% uh, uh, agree, and then 3% not sure. So when you look at this statistic, I think this is kind of interesting. Pastors should endorse candidates from for public office, from, and it says 87% disagree. Why does it say 87% disagree? Well, the reason they're saying that is because of what the laws are. The law says if you do not pay taxes as a church, then you do not have the right to push a candidate. And that's why there's a separation of church and state. And that's why there's this disagreement here, which is, which is pretty good, and I understand that. But if churches would pay taxes, then they would have the opportunity to also uh, endorse certain candidates. And that would put them on a level playing, playing ground with everyone else, okay? And so that's kind of what this is, this, um, the survey is all about. Kind of moving on, the obligations of Christian citizens, of all Christian citizens, be informed and vote. Should we do more than vote? Yes, that's what Wayne Grudem says. And what does he say you can do? Give money and time to certain candidates or parties. Write letters to support certain candidates. Run for office. Or serve in the military. Great ways to be a part of this. Abraham Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address, It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. He's saying because people have sacrificed their lives for you, you ought to do something in return for this nation as well and do it for them. Um, and then the last part here is churches and the Internal Revenue Service IRS guidelines. Since 1954, the IRS has placed regulations that prohibit pastors and churches from supporting specific candidates. However, pastors have the right to inform their congregants of what each political candidate supports 
or represents. And so we do have this right as pastors or as ministers or as congregants to push this in our churches, even from the pulpit, um, to be able to push what each candidate believes, what they stand for, what they represent and support. And we ought to be able to do that. And then our preaching along with that would also inform people exactly who is the better candidate. But it's up to the congregants to make that decision. All right. All right. This has been Religion in the Public Square, Christians in Government, Part 2, really. And uh, and this has been our outline by Wayne Grew. All right. Good to be with you today. God bless you and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.